Welcome back to the City Life Family Podcast. My name's Chris. I'm going to be one of the hosts. I'm with my good friend, Jared. And today we are talking about the scattered church. Um, How does the Christian live in a gospel-centered community? Why do we think that matters that we as ministry leaders, elders, members of local churches um, call people to move from just the pews and sitting in a Sunday morning gathering to actually participating in the life of the church, getting to know each other, uh, spending time in each other's living rooms, breaking bread, having meals, knowing other people's stories. That matters so much. We do not uh, think that that is an option, okay, for like the varsity Christians in the church. We think everybody in your local church should be participating in both the gathered church on Sunday morning and the scattered church that meets throughout the week. Now, why do we believe that? Jared, there's a lot of questions, but uh, I, I want to get into some of that today. So uh, as I think about uh, city groups and kind of living in biblical community, I just want to ask you, Jared, have you, uh, are you doing that? Are you in community? Are you uh, hosting a city group? Are you um, kind of doing some of this stuff? Yes or no? Oh, yeah. We're doing it. My family is doing it. We just had a city group yesterday. Come on. There was a dog that was running around that peed in the living room in the middle of kids, <laughs> babies, crawling around. Yes. There was somebody, I hope they don't listen to this episode, yes. but there was a parent that gave uh, one of their, their one-year-old a ball to be occupied, and then the girl put the ball in her mouth, but I didn't have the heart to tell them that it was actually the dog's ball that they play <laughs> fetch with. And I'm like... It's just life and community. Just so yeah, that was what happened yesterday. Yes. City group, but oh, we also had a conversation about the Bible, and it was oh. it, it was good. Ate a meal together. It was great. Yeah, if you're listening, you're probably thinking and recalling maybe some of your favorite experiences in community. <laughs> okay, uh, we were talking about this pre air getting on here. It's like I have literally seen neighbors who I moved into the neighborhood. They were distant from Christ, had no local church kind of come from some random church exposure. I've seen those people literally step into our living room through an invitation just to be a part of a a meal in the neighborhood. Over time, warm up to the gospel, believe in Jesus, get baptized and become part of a local church. I have that, I have that story. I have those names. (laughs) Okay. Jared and Katie. Uh, But I also, I also have the story of people coming over. We have lots of little babies in the living room. Everybody's half God's kids. And, and, and somebody wasn't really self-aware of, no, you know this one person, who doesn't really care if their kids are sick, they're bringing their kids wherever <laughs> they go. And the three of their four kids just start explosive vomiting all over our living room. And then we all just got sick for like the next two weeks. <laughs> and like the amount of bitterness that happened in my heart when I was vomiting because you had brought your kid over to my house was significant, okay? So as we talk about biblical community, can we keep it real, Jared? Th- th- this is a safe place this morning. We we are wrestling with how messy it is and yet how beautiful it is. Like both are simultaneously true, right? Like <laughs> God does amazing work as we're in community that's shaped and defined by the gospel. And yet it's costly mm-hmm. and messy mm-hmm. and people don't share political views. And there's that one random person that never brings any food to the potluck. And they're always kind of the, the taker and that one person that doesn't understand that you've got to put your kids to bed by nine and they're staying and they want to just share stories from high school. And you're like, okay, it's 2 a.m. You literally need to leave my house, right? So so this is all there, but maybe Jared, would you kick us off like as Christians, why do we value the scattered church? Like just how did Jesus make disciples? How do we see this in the Bible? Why is this not optional for us? Yeah, well, I think whether it's Jesus gathering, calling disciples to one another and like living with that band of people who are very different from himself, or you look to acts like we were just looking to a few weeks ago um, about the first community, you know, people hear the gospel preached from Peter in Acts 2, Pentecost, you know, and then all of a sudden you see them gathering together, this radical community. And so we see that the gospel actually creates community. So it doesn't create individuals with tickets to have, I mean, kind of whatever, but the idea is um, God is forming a people and it's not just a a vertical relationship, there's a horizontal relationship. And so you have all kinds of people that are coming together that are very different from one another. Um, You know, they're different, like you said, different politically, they may be different ethnically, and may be yep. different age-wise, socioeconomically, all of those things. Um, and you see that the, the gospel creates something powerful. It even uses language. You know, we think of those, the terms of like 
brother and sister in the New Testament um, as being like this antiquated Christian jargon or whatever. But those were intentional words that they were using to remind each other, hey, we've got a bond together in Christ that we are actually supposed to live like brothers and sisters. The gospel actually creates that community. Yep, yep, absolutely. So yeah, and I think that was one of the most startling things in the Roman Empire about the local church. Yep. Uh, Jews and Gentiles could not have been more different and seen the world from a more different perspective. Everything in society was separating those things. And yet within that, those constructs, all of a sudden you've got slave and free, you've got rich and poor, like you said, mm-hmm. and they're all sitting in the same living room, worshiping the same living resurrected Jesus Christ. Yep. And the outside world would look in and be like, how are you two people getting along? Right, this is like the Black Lives Matter and Make America Great Again. People walking in with the same hat, and they're sitting around the same table worshiping the same Jesus, and it it had that kind of power. But we also talk about gospel doesn't just create community, Mm -hmm. but it shapes community, Uh, it transforms community, it redeems community. So, Jared, when you think about in those terms. When you get around a group of Christians, what's different than when you just get around a group of people who are who are connected politically or connected because they the kids play on the same sports team, right? There's lots of different kinds of community. And getting people together isn't always a great thing. Like you can kill each other. You can yeah. compete and compare and perform and pretend and like and so the gospel has to do something unique among his people. So I know we're I know we're in the clouds right now, yeah. but we're going to move from the clouds down to the practical. But we really do want to get this philosophy and ministry, this theology to really ground us. So so why? Yeah. Well, I think the gospel shapes community in a unique way because you have people that relationally just act differently toward one another. So when something goes wrong relationally, maybe in a normal context, like somebody makes you upset, you kind of want to like remove yourself from them. Like you want to cast them off, whatever. But the gospel does something different and then it compels us to love one another yep. because like Jesus loved us when we were far off to forgive one another like Jesus did yep. to us be- when we were far off in rebellion yep. he came like and moved toward us he forgave us and so you have all these this this like relational thing that happens that we're not like it shapes our community in ways that we are like bonded to one another yep. we are going to work no matter how messy it is, how weird it is, how difficult it is, um, Christians are a group of people that actually move toward one another relationally uh, in a powerful way. And it, you know, it, it does all sorts of things, not yep. just that, but it calls us to be a people who are, are fighting sin together, who yes. are encouraging each other to like run toward Jesus together. We're fighting yep. sin together. We're moving out toward other people, toward lost people together. Like all of these things, it just, yep. it, it shapes us. We're, Yep. We should be uniquely yep. like Jesus centered and all those yep. things. Yeah, the gospel shapes that because you think about it, there's lots of groups that are like, ah, oh, we're the good people, the society is the bad people, yep. right? So, you, um, and so, so we have the answers, and our our goal is to distance ourselves. So, but the gospel doesn't do that because right. the gospel literally, He's in heaven, He came to a fallen, broken world. We we worship a God who's on mission to move towards the lost, mm-hmm. right? And so for a Christian community to huddle up and just say, we're gonna isolate, that's actually not what we're doing here. This is not a fundamental group where we just, we're gonna move away from all the bad people. No, we are going to move towards in love those who don't maybe agree with us mm-hmm. and look like us and behave like us and believe like us. So so all that to say is the gospel makes us a community. Our rhythms, if we kind of put, directional arrows to this is yeah. up towards God in towards a spiritual family and out towards a fallen broken world. And so those are some rhythms of a gospel centered community. And, um, I just, could we name a few of the temptations as we enter into community, Jared, why do we need the gospel? Because there's a lot of pitfalls we can fall into when we say gospel centered community, and we're going to start doing life outside of Sunday morning. Have you ever felt maybe the tension of like, honestly, I just want to go into community and give the right answer and get out or, yeah. Um, I want to avoid having to really sacrifice and serve here. I'm just going to show up, eat, and leave. Like, is there any temptation you feel when we talk about community and really start getting into the practicals of city groups? Where do you feel this temptation to not live according to the gospel? Can I say that? You know, like, <laughs> well, I, I mean, as a parent of four kids, I'm usually yes. tired. And yes. so I usually want to not do, like, yes. a lot of days I don't want to do anything. It's not convenient. People, yeah, it yeah. is not convenient and comfortable. No, <laughs> not convenient at all. I'm like, no. I don't want, so yes, I, you know, I show up, I'm like, it would be a lot simpler, a lot easier to not go 
deep with people yeah. to be able to, I can probably answer this small group Bible study question with a yeah. quick verse, with a quick phrase in get out of the way. Or I can, you know, it's at my house. I can retreat to the back for a few yeah. minutes, get a little break. Yes. Um, and so I think, um, I mean, I think even like talking about that, naming that. Yes. And, you know, there's a little bit of, there's, you know, we're tired, exhausted in one hand. You're also, there's kind of a pride in that, like we can come into it thinking, well, I don't, I don't actually need these people. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and it'd be easier to just pretend that everything's okay or to like spout off some verses and look smart. So people think I'm great and, yep. and perform for other people. Yep. Uh, but that's not what he calls us to do. What about you? Like, what no, do you no, think? I, yeah, all of those are there. And, um, you know, I think, I think the temptation, even in ministry is I can start to be a little guarded yep. and you're trying to figure out where's the appropriate places to share the worst and invite people in. Um, there's also a spirit of grumbling that can happen mm -hmm. in my heart. Like I don't see biblical community. Sometimes when I open up my phone, I see something scheduled as a gift to participate in, but as a, a burden I have to get through. And I know that's wrong because every time it's over, God has always given me more energy and grace because I did it. Does that make any sense? I always, it's almost like a workout. You, you end, you never, I sometimes drive to the gym and I'm like, I do not want to do this. Yep. But by the time I get back in my car, I'm so thankful I did. And, um, and so I, that, that is part of it. But um, just to make sure you guys know the conversation we're having today is the gathered church is, we had talked about this Sunday morning gathering. How does the gospel shape and form everything we do there? And why do we do it? Today we're talking about, as we think about the church holistically, there's two primary rhythms. One's the gathering, the other one's scattering, right? Living in context. And uniquely at church, we talked about a lot about how the gospel makes us a people, shapes what we do. But just to give name to what a lot of our churches call these, these are either missional communities, gospel communities, but we uniquely, a lot of them, our churches call them city groups, okay? So um, what is a city group? City groups are mid-sized communities living on mission uh, to different neighborhoods or networks. And they're living out the three different dimensional kind of aspects of the gospel, up towards Christ, pursuing him, fighting sin, inward as a family, outward towards the world. And so they're kind of formational, they're communal, and they're missional. And I, Jared, I want to ask you, you know, what makes a healthy city group? As you think about, hey, if you had to just pop into a random church member city group, um, or if you're evaluating your own leadership in a city group, what are you saying? Hey, these are a few things I'm looking for. These are a few points of like health that mark healthy gospel centered community. Um, and maybe this will be helpful and instructional to some folks who are saying, is my city group healthy? Yeah. Is my leadership healthy? Um, is our group drifting from the gospel, not really modeling it? Um, so give me some thoughts on what, what you look for in a healthy group. Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm not sure I'm, I'm assessing my own leadership right yeah. now. I'm like, oh, wait, wait a minute. Maybe <laughs> I'm not secure. doing this okay. Right now. <laughs> Maybe I should punt this to somebody else. <laughs> I, I do think, though, speaking of that, I think healthy leadership is yes. like just paramount to yeah, a healthy city group. Like you have to have leaders who feel called, who are willing yeah. to like actually uh, like like lay down their lives for their yeah. group, invest in the people. Shepherd, really. Oh yeah, shepherd people, totally. So you need leaders who actually... Um, feel called and know where they're going yeah. and that all and, and that whole thing on top of that speaking of knowing where they're going yeah. I think there's a sense in which a healthy group has a defined sense of of mission they like know what they're trying to do together and so yeah. it's like hey we're you know we're a people who live in this neighborhood and we're you know missing to our neighborhood or we're group yeah. of young adults who live in midtown and we're trying to do like we're trying to reach these people yeah. so there's a defined sense of mission and a defined sense of knowing how like how are you going to grow spiritually together so there's there's like even defined rhythms yes. of like what Huge. are we what are we how are we going to get to what we're trying to do yeah. like how are we going to accomplish yeah. that and so you have i mean so many markers but yeah, yeah. healthy leaders Defined mission, uh, yep. defined rhythms that you have. Yep. I don't know. What would you say on yeah, top no, I, of that? Yeah, no, and the, just the mission thing can be so overwhelming for folks. I try to tell them, and we've talked about this too, is your mission can be a neighborhood you live in, a, a relational network you're a part of. So your wife's a nurse, healthcare workers are a great network. They know other healthcare workers, um, young adults, a one of the most connected networks in our city. Young adults know each other. They want to be together. So that's a great network. Mm -hmm. um, so if you don't live in proximity, how do you stay on mission? Sometimes there's a network. The other way your city group needs to think about this is possibly um, 
Could we be a community of missionaries? So we all live, work, and play in different places. We have different networks, but we're going to come together and pray for whatever our missional networks are. And so um, that's another one. But yeah, just marks of a healthy community. We talked about it. Leadership, kind of define roles, define leaders, define mission, define rhythms, because no family, once it gets big enough, we can't just like, I can't just text you all the time and try to hang out. We have to like put it on the calendar ahead of time to get yeah. together. That That's loving. And then uh, one of the things I always look for is, is there both an organic and organized connection? What I mean by this is the healthiest groups I've ever been a part of, they have the organized down. They know they're going to have taco night on Tuesday. The next Tuesday, they're going to do Bible study. The next Tuesday, they're going to do some kind of an event where they can invite non-believers. But but you know what? There's something about like when you get past just what's on the calendar and people in that group start hanging out organically, yep. they start texting each other. Hey, would you want to come over for dinner on Friday? Hey, I'm playing in a sand volleyball league. Would you want to jump on my team? That stuff really bonds the group. And so if you're a city group leader and you're just thinking, how do I get things on the calendar to keep us going in a direction? That's step one. Step two is fostering community that's outside of that too. So um, th- that's there. Now, what are some challenges with the scattered church? How have you, how do you have to get creative in different seasons of life? Have you ever felt challenges, seasons of life, all that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you mentioned babies throwing up. Oh my gosh. And like, well, I think one of the things is, so for our stage with yes. little kids, you're just so tired. And so, part, okay. So here's one struggle our yep. specific city group has had. Um, and we've just been talking about this the last few weeks, is that we started off as a young families group. We're not so young, and our Mm -hmm. kids aren't quite as young anymore. But it was like, oh, we're going to be there for each other and do this thing. And we're like, wait, none of us have any capacity to be there for each other. And so there's a sense in which, like, wait, should we have made this a multi-generational thing? And so there's this struggle of, like, knowing some stages of life, the ways that they're demanding are just unique. Yep. And so that's kind of a, yep. it's just kind of a hard thing to think through. And we're actually really, we're, we're making a transition right now to become from going from just young families to a more multi-generational thing. So we're like, yeah. Hey, we need some wisdom from some empty nesters. <laughs> we need some, we're going to recruit some young people. I don't know if we want them in community or we just want them to be our babysitters yes. when we, so we can go out on the weekend. So it's just kind of an interesting, like life stage can present some interesting challenges really to that. Y- yeah, I agree. That's for sure there. And I, as we look at our church and my experience has been uh young adults ha- are absolutely crushing oh absolutely crushing yeah. community they have a felt need they want to be around together um they have availability they that I mean they just naturally do it they they stay connected they play on you know like i said volleyball basketball they're playing yard games in the summer uh they're doing bible study they're inviting other friends they're very very active and have a felt need because honestly, isolation is something they fight. Loneliness is something they fight. Then you get married kids and all of a sudden your baby has to go to bed at seven. Well, now what do we start the city group at? 5.30, we're rushing over, mm-hmm. trying to get a dinner. Somebody's trying to get their home because they don't want to mess with their sleep time. And then I, you have to adjust your rhythms. Now do we do men's in the morning and then women's you know, the other time, a different time in the month while the men stay at home and watch the kids. I mean, it's, you have to get really creative mm-hmm. once you get in this kind of season of life with kids and then you get teenagers and sports and dramas and music and dances and it, it gets even more chaotic. So across our church, what we're seeing is young adults and empty nesters have the best experience. Folks with lots of little kids or little kids in, in, in the season of life, it's just more obstacles that they have to overcome. And you've got to get creative with your rhythms. And what we figured out is our our winning rhythm in this life stage was a family meal, everybody together, all the chaos. We all just eat together. All the kids are there. It's crazy. We're not going to get a lot done. We're just going to eat a meal. Men in the morning, women in the evening, and then you switch. Mm. And uh, and then you try to do something again together. But, but it's challenging. Those are just trying to get creative yeah. with those rhythms to say, kids, we want you to be a part of this. We want you to see mom and dad worshiping Jesus in community, but uh, it, it can get pretty dynamic. Oh, so. It is. I mean, that's actually one of the reasons we our group meets on Sundays. Yeah. And the timing thing with the kids is the reason that we're meeting on Sundays because we're like, wait, you, no one can get to somebody's house by 530 after work. Yes. And then other people, you know, their kids go to bed at 630 or 7 or yeah. 730. We just didn't have time to do no. all the 
all, all the things. things. And so, yeah, so yeah, we're, we're meeting on Sunday, which leaves me quite tired after yeah. coming, you know, coming home from Sunday, <laughs> yes. I'm scrambling yes. to clean the house. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to throw everything yeah. in this closet and I'm hoping no one opens the closet. Right. Yeah. Right. No, Jared, I was almost ready to rebuke you <laughs> pre-show when I heard that your city groups on Sunday, I'm like, bro, I want to worship the Lord, be with God's people. Yesterday, a great NFL football game was on, and I was not ministering to God's people. I was sitting in my sweatpants, in my couch, eating nachos to the glory of God. So you're a better pastor than I am. Okay, so as a pastor, elder, ministry worker, leader, intern across the City Light family, I just want to, you know, what are your thoughts for them? Uniquely, community can be a little bit different for folks that are invisible forms of spiritual leadership Um, because you're the leader in the room, because everybody sees you, because people are going to want to be a part of your city group. Um, they're going to want to be a part of what you're doing. And so what are some challenges that you felt or maybe others across this, our city life family are going to feel just because they're, they are the leader. And so um, how do they experience biblical community and what are maybe unique obstacles there? Um, and any encouragements you would have, like sometimes you're not going to resolve all these tensions, but just having somebody say it can be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think, well, there's lots of things yeah. in this one that comes to mind is that people are used to be used to you being the one who's like pouring out, maybe the yeah. one that has the answers. And so people aren't necessarily going to like come up to you and ask you all the questions yeah. and try to dig in deep. So that presents an interesting dynamic. Cause that's not like, we just said this a few minutes ago, like that's not what community is. Like community is like this mutual come, yeah. kind of self-sacrificing, mutual yeah. giving thing. And people aren't always used to you being like in yeah. that place. And so they're not going to naturally come to you. I, I think for me also, it's interesting to know how to like, uh, you know, I see my city group. I Part of me wants to like lead really strong strongly yeah. because I'm like, oh, I have a vision for this, or I feel like I have a good answer yeah. for this, or, you know, the conversation's kind of derailing. And I want to always like jump in and do the thing, but there's something about it. Like if you start leading too strongly, yes, then there's always this you. interesting dynamic of, of then everyone else is going to like take a back seat and just wait for you to lead and do everything. And so you've got to sometimes hold yourself back. Sometimes yeah. you've got to like use maybe the leadership or discern. I don't know. Yep. Isn't that interesting yep. how that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I, I'm picking up on everything you're saying. And I, I think one is a ministry leader. When you get in a community, you have to understand like, it's very possible to be in biblical community and be extraordinarily lonely. Mm. And I think you have to get really good at inviting people to say, Hey, I need you guys to ask questions back. Like yeah. some of you guys are not going to just press in and say, how's your marriage? How's your parenting? How's your ministry? How's your heart, your soul? Guys, I need you to actually ask those questions here. So, um, and then maybe you leading out of that authentic authenticity because it's so easy to just facilitate the room, pick up your house after it's over and go to bed. But I realize like I'm there for me too. Mm-hmm. Does it make sense? And so, um, yeah, leading lonely is a real possibility. Uh, the other question is just like, you're gonna, relational burnout is another possibility because when your group grows, cause you're the leader and people wanna be in it, you feel this pressure to multiply quickly to kind of get the size dynamics back to a manageable mm-hmm. place. Yep. But then it's a whole new set of people you've got to get to know, a whole new set of people you have to have in your home. And so just trying to figure that whole thing out, does it make any sense? Is like, am I bonding with these people for like 10 years or is this like a nine month run where we're going to be multiplying out? So uh, those are just some challenges. They're just challenges we've got to continue to, to lean into and um, but here's what I come back to. There's, when I look at Jesus' ministry, um, yes, he preached sermons, and yes, he performed miracles, but at the end of the day, he made disciples in community. This is his, there was no discipleship that was happening outside of biblical community. And so we need to be people that continue to foster those relationships and invest in those spaces. So uh, anything else you would say to ministry leaders trying to figure out the, the mess that can be these beautiful thing called city groups? Well, I think it's just the the reminder that... <laughs> It is difficult. It is messy. There's some unique challenges, just like we were just talking about. There's just unique challenges, but there is something. If we just need to be willing, even though we work, a lot of us work for 
for the church, yeah. you know, as a job. There's a sense in which we need to have the humility to come in to realize, come hey, on. this like this is for us. Yes. We need yes. these people. We're not better than them because just because you know more Bible answers yes. than they are, or you know more about the church. Like we need these people. We need c- community, and so we need to submit ourselves to what God oh. has actually called us into. Hundred percent. A last thing is every story that I think gets probably all of me and you excited and probably the listeners, it's the gospel story. Mm. It's the story of the lost person being found, of the isolated person finding a family to belong to, of someone who's chained up in darkness and doesn't know where to confess and if they'll be loved if they do. The story of the marriage who's struggling, they've got all the secrets and the polished Facebook profile, but it's a hot mess. But then they step into community and somebody loves them and walks them through that. The story of children not just being exposed to youth sports or becoming great little, you know, whatever musicians or in academia, but but of kids really understanding like who they are is a part of this thing called the church and God is real and has a plan and purpose for their life. And it's just normative that you would walk with God for a lifetime. That's all modeled through biblical community. And so I just, I want to just let you guys know it is messy. There will be fractured relationships. There will be hurt. There will be conflict. There will be sacrifice required. And yet I believe like you, that like that, that's part of how we get shaped and formed mm. is by stepping into this, right, Jared? It's not avoiding it. Mm. It's by stepping into this and saying, I actually think this is how this whole gospel thing works out in people's lives. And I think this is actually what the Lord wants to do in me as he reminds me, I need that person who thinks very different in my life. I, I need to figure out how to love them. Mm. And that's going to make me reliant on God. And it's going to test my gospel centeredness in some ways. Does it make sense? Like, yeah. And so uh, we love hanging out. It's easy to hang out with yep. you, uh, but but there's others that are, it doesn't come as naturally. And so will you love across the wall like that? And so um, anyways, I just want to say, do not grow weary of doing good. Thank you for thinking about city groups and biblical context and, and uh, gospel center community. We appreciate you guys jumping in with us today. And we can't wait to talk to you guys next week about resting. Uh, we can be weary. We want to be talking about rest. We'll do that next month. Thanks so much.